Hi, good morning. Thanks for letting me come to you via, via video this week. I appreciate that a lot. We are going to be talking about Joseph. And if I were going to make a trading card for Joseph, it would be really difficult. Um, you know, I do want to make one, but there's so much that happens with Joseph. So I'm going to go, I'm pretty much just going to read headings. And if you have an ESV, you can follow the headings along. And um, But in a couple spots, we're going to dive deep and talk about it. So Joseph. So you remember Abraham got the promise from God and the blessing from God. And then he had Ishmael and Isaac. And Isaac was the younger, but he was the child of the promise. And he got the blessing. And then Isaac had Esau and Jacob, and Jacob was the second born, but he got the blessing from Isaac, and then Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and loved Rachel, got mixed up and hoodwinked and tricked, and had to marry Leah, and had a whole bunch of kids by Leah, and didn't have any kids by Rachel, and had kids by Bilhah and Zilpah, which were Rachel and Leah's um, sort of assistants, nurse um, women that helped them a lot. And finally, God, it says that God saw Rachel and had pity on her and gave her a child, and that was Joseph. And so Joseph was born maybe as much as 20 years after Reuben, who's the firstborn, and he was the favorite. I mean, he was just loved, and Jacob um, Jacob loved Joseph so much. And, you know, you got all these 20-year-old, 20, 20 to 16-year-olds, and you got this little baby, and, you know, there's he's just precious, and, and you know, Rachel's the pretty one. Joseph's going to be more handsome than all these other ugly dudes. And um, just, you know, you know, just even this happens today, right? A new baby in the house. Everybody else gets jealous. Well, this gets amplified as Joseph gets older and he gets a special coat. And, you know, it's usually translated a coat of many colors. There's also a theory that it was a coat with sleeves. It could also be translated that it had sleeves on it. And that all means favoritism. That all means that he's the favorite. Because if you're a hard worker, I mean, like, I would not go dig a hole in my long sleeve shirt, right? I'm going to wear a t-shirt to dig a hole. Any kind of work you're going to do, especially in the, their day when you made your shirt and your shirt was your shirt, and that was like the shirt you had, um, you wouldn't have sleeves on it if you're going to be a hard worker. So Joseph is already sort of like, oh yeah, it's not my night to to you know mow the grass because I might get my shirt dirty. I might tear up my shirt. So sleeves or colors, they would both fall into a thing like that. So he grows up and he's he's kind of treasured and he's kind of exempt from all the hard work of brothers and all that stuff. And then he has these dreams, and. He doesn't know any better but to share the dreams with everybody. And the dreams are pretty much the same where everybody is bowing down to Joseph. He has a dream, um, and it just says flat out, and this is Genesis 37, 3, Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. He made him a robe of many colors, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream. We were binding sheaves in the field, and my sheaf arose and stood upright, and all of your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down. And they're all like, what, you're going to rule over us? We're going to bow down to you? I don't think so. So they hated him even more. Then he had another dream, told it to his brothers, said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. 
Now this gets pretty wild because you start looking at family trees. All these guys' mothers were Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah. And when Joseph has a dream, there's the sun and the moon and 11, is it 11, and 11 stars. Well, the sun and the moon are Jacob and Rachel. Where's Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah? Like, they don't even count. They don't even, when Joseph has a dream about who's bowing down to who and where the authority is, their moms aren't even considered. Their moms don't even show up. And um, so that would make, not only are they mad that he's saying that he's, they're all going to bow down to him, but there's also this other thing happening where I'm prophesying and I'm not even considering your mom, your mother, who was the wife of my dad, not him. Only my mom counts. My mom is better than your mom, basically. They get even more mad. Even here, Jacob gets mad. And he's like, what are you doing? Your mother and your brothers, are we all going to bow down before you? And um, it says, but Jacob kept the saying in mind. He was kind of like, hmm, you know, my grandpa told me about stuff like this. Who's his grandpa? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. <laughs> Abraham was his grandpa, right? So when Jacob's hearing this stuff about Joseph, he's like, okay, there might be something to this. I'm going to. I'm going to keep an eye on this. So the relationship with his brothers doesn't get any better. And one day Jacob sends Joseph out to check on them, which is just like the worst thing. Jacob, come on, man, don't do it. Because they're all out working. And he sends Joseph out to basically tattle. Get some, go get some material to tattle on them. He doesn't know he's doing that, but we know that that's how that's going to happen. And so they see him coming and they grab him and they beat him up and they talk about killing him. They hate him that much and they're that disconnected from him. They've been hating him that long. Uh, he's, he's at least 10 years old. He might be 15 or even 17 and they've been hating him since he was born. So the other thing that kind of happens in the whole life of Joseph is this sort of side story about bitterness and unforgiveness. And as you watch where the bitterness is, where the hatred is, how many times in chapter 37 and 38 and 36, Joseph is hated. His brothers hated him even more. This hate just keeps coming up and it keeps getting worse and then it's acted upon in chapter 38 and they say let's kill him and Reuben steps in and he says let's not kill him let's just throw him in a hole and it says that Reuben was going to come back later and rescue him we don't know why that didn't happen but it didn't happen they sit down and eat and they're eating within earshot of him down in the hole. So he might be screaming. He might be hurt down in the hole, but he might also just be calling out to them the whole time they're eating and they're eating and hearing his calls for help and his screams, which makes what they did even worse because then they see some, some guys going by that are slave traders and they say, let's sell Joseph to them. Because then he's as good as dead, but we don't have the guilt. And they do. They reason that out, that they didn't... I mean, at least they didn't kill him, right? All we did was to kind of change his job on him. And this is what hatred does. Hatred and bitterness, it, it turns everything into a lie that you even lie to yourself to justify yourself. Well, I mean, it wasn't that bad of a thing. I mean, that guy kind of deserved what I did, or at least I didn't do this. Their hatred and their bitterness made them think that it was okay to sell their father's favorite son to slave traders because at least they didn't kill him. At least it wasn't as bad as that. 
That, that is what hatred has done to their souls. That's what that sin, that sin of hating him has corrupted them so bad that they think that that's okay to sell him as a slave. Um, they know, they know full well that Jacob loves this guy and, and they know it's going to be terrible. So they kill a goat or something. They spread blood all over Joseph's coat and they bring it back. And they don't even say what happened. They, they just kind of bring it back and, and show up. Um, this is at the end of chapter 37. They sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Like, they're making Jacob make a bad decision. Make a terrible choice. Who cares if it's his coat, Right? Um, it's not the coat that matters, but it's a one-of-a-kind coat. He identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. And so these guys' hatred and their sin is so bad that they have a chance to say what the truth is right here. You, Jacob, he is so rich and so powerful. If they told him right here, Joseph got sold to slave traders in Egypt. Jacob would be able to go rescue him. He would he has the he has the resources to go and rescue Joseph right now. But even here in their silence, they are sinning. In their in their hesitancy to say what is true, they are making the sin even worse. Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. I will mourn for the rest of my life. And his father wept for him. Now, you also got to just think, how evil and wicked, if I sound mad, I am kind of getting mad. How evil and wicked are these brothers that they would even try to console Jacob? They're not trying to console Jacob. They're trying to console themselves from their own guilt that they've destroyed their father, right? Oh, all right. So just get really mad at them. Just get, oh, you just want to, Reuben, pooh, Simeon, pooh, right? Just mad. So Joseph, all right, so we got real slow motion there. We're going to get fast motion again. So Joseph gets sold into Egypt, and uh, he gets sold into this house of Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. This is ch starting chapter 39 now. The captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And uh, yeah, there, so yeah, we too much to tell. Ishmaelites, like they're cousins right their their relation that's just it's just terrible so uh joseph becomes a servant he does a great job everything he does is just awesome and potiphar sees it and he's like dude you are awesome everything i give you to do you do excellent at now you gotta hesitate and think okay when I wake up and I'm in a bad mood, I can't do anything. I'm like worthless, right? Um, if I, I mean, everything I do, if, if I'm just, uh, if I'm, if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, like I can't even wash the car right, right? Um, I can't even make my oatmeal the right way. It's, it's too runny or it's too thick or it's too hot or it's too, ah. Uh. There's something going on with Joseph that even though, he went from being the most beloved to dirt bag, beat up, thrown in a hole, sold to a bunch of Ishmaelites as a slave, sent to Egypt. He was still doing stuff well. And he was still doing stuff. He had not given up on his whole life. Um, which he totally could have, right? But he didn't. And instead, he thrived, and he did great. And he did so well that um, it says in verse 6, 
He left the Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything except the food he ate. The only thing he had to worry about was putting food in his mouth. And Joseph took care of everything else. That's how awesome he was. So then Potiphar's wife comes along and she's like, come to bed with me. And he's like, nope, I can do anything. My master has put me in charge of everything. I am not going to do that. Um, he is not, there's no one greater in his house than I am, nor has he kept anything away from me. But I'm not going to do this great wickedness and sin against God. Whoa. Okay, so Joseph, there, there aren't Jewish people in Egypt that he can like go to church with on Sunday and meet up with and uh, fellowship with and then go back to working for Potiphar. He is all alone. He, his, his relationship with God is completely singular. And nobody around is going to see him and be like, oh, I can't believe you called yourself this because you did that. He is totally on his own. And he says, I'm not going to sin against my God. That's awesome. This is the whole, if you were on a desert island and nobody knew about it, would you do it? And Joseph wouldn't because he's, as far as God is concerned, he's on a desert island and nobody's going to know what he does. And he says, no, I'm not going to sin against God. One thing leads to another. She tries to grab him. He runs away from her. And she has such a grab on him that his clothes get, she rips his clothes off of him as he's trying to flee away. Husband comes home. She says, look, he tried to attack me. I've got his clothes. I assume he went and found some other clothes somewhere. And... The Hebrew servant whom you brought against us came into me to laugh at me. And as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and he fled out of the house. So she makes it look like it's his fault. Potiphar is furious, throws him in prison. A couple different takes on this story have happened. A lot of them are real reaches because it doesn't say this clearly or it doesn't say that clearly. So I'm just going to take it at face value. And say Potiphar was mad and threw him in jail. Okay? Because um, Potiphar was mad. It says his anger was kindled. Some people read that as his anger was kindled at his wife. I don't, I don't think that. I think he was just mad. So uh, he throws him in prison. And he sits in prison for a long time. But you know what? Everything he does is really good. <laughs> And again, he could just give up and wallow. He could blame that lady. Man, Potiphar's wife, she did me wrong. She did this and that. My brothers, they did this to me and they should have. No, you don't get any of that from Joseph. And um, man, it's just, it's so awesome. Because we, I would be so quick to blame a whole bunch of other people that caused all my problems, right? He doesn't do any of that. He works in the prison he is great at working in the prison, and they put him in charge of everything in the prison. <laughs> and then these two guys get thrown into prison with him. And uh, a cupbearer and a bread and a baker. And the cupbearer would drink a drink before the king would drink it to make sure the king wasn't poisoned. And the baker would be baking the bread that the king, that Pharaoh or the king would eat. And something has happened around his birthday. Or, uh, yeah, and they're thrown in, and they both have dreams. And Joseph interprets the dreams. And the cupbearer, good news, you're going to get set free. Baker, bad news, you're going to get killed, and the birds are going to eat your head, and you're dead. And so the next day it happens. It all comes true. And um, I, I wish I had, like, a little timer thing because so far you've got yeah well this is just there's like 72 things that happen to Joseph that also happened to Jesus and I've been holding back on the mentioning them but here you know Jesus was put on the cross between two criminals 
And one of those criminals was delivered to salvation when Jesus said, today I'll see you in paradise. And the other one wasn't, right? And here is Joseph, and he is in prison, and one of them gets delivered and the other one doesn't. I mean, it's just, it's like, yeah, there's all these parallels, like tons of parallels between Joseph and Jesus. So they say, oh man, well, I'll remember you when I go back out. And the guy doesn't remember him at all. Two years go by. Pharaoh has a bad dream. Cupbearer is like, I remember a guy when I was in prison. Remember when you got mad two years ago and you threw me in prison? There was a guy there that can interpret dreams. Let's go see if he's still there. <laughs> and he is. Poor Joseph. So we know he's been in there at least two years, probably longer. And it says that he got cleaned up and shaved and then comes before Pharaoh. And that is a really, really big deal. Because the Egyptians, in their culture, body hair was bad. And so they shaved. They shaved as much of their body hair as they could. And they were uh, just bald. And then they would put on ornaments on their bald head right? Jewish people, later on, this doesn't happen yet, 430 some odd years later, there would be a law that you don't even cut the hair on the sides of your head, that you let it grow. In um, early Jewish culture, a beard was a sign of how manly a man was. And so, and that's still the case in, in Islam. And uh, so for Joseph to shave, when it says he got cleaned up and shaved, he turned into an Egyptian. He crossed the line and he is now, uh, he can't show up before Pharaoh looking like some kind of foreigner. You don't just show up before the king in your I'm with stupid t-shirt, right? You show up before the king and you put a collar on and you wear a tie and you, yes, your majesty. So, he shaves. He goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him his dream. And Joseph says, I can't interpret your dream. I love this on the VeggieTales version. When he says, I cannot interpret your dream. And all the people that brought him in, they all go. <gasps> and he says, but God will give you an interpretation. After all this time, all this, every, if anybody if Joseph would have said, I have given up on God, anybody would be like, yeah, you have. Good grief. Poor guy. The dude in prison that made a promise forgot about you. The, the lady that was your slave master framed you. Your slave master bought you. The, uh, your cousins were slave dealers and they sold you. Your brothers beat you up and threw you in a hole and sold you to your cousins. It, Gosh, just curse God and die, like Job's wife says to him. And Joseph does it. And not only does he still have faith in God, he has a faith that is bold enough to talk about it to Pharaoh and say, God's going to do this for you, Pharaoh. And so then God does it. And God gives Joseph the interpretation of the dream. There's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of famine. Oh my gosh, I have to hurry up if we're going to get through. <laughs> and Pharaoh believes him. What? I mean, something about what Joseph said struck Pharaoh that Pharaoh believed. This dude they just pulled out of prison has never shaved before, and they just shaved, and now he's in charge. So Pharaoh puts him in charge, and he is in charge of everything. And we know how the whole story goes, but I want you to act like you don't. Just imagine, Joseph is now done, done with his homeland. He is done with his brothers. He is never going back. They give him a new name, Zaphnath Panea. His new name is Zaphnath Panea. He marries a preacher's daughter, but she's not a god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, preacher's daughter. She's a the god of the Egyptians, one of their priests' daughter, marries her. They have kids. He names one of their kids 
everything that happened to me is forgotten. And names the other kid fruitful and abundant. And so Ephraim and Manasseh are born little half Egyptian, half Jewish kids, which I could get on a soapbox about people talking about interracial marriage and how it's bad. Tell that to Joseph. <laughs> Tell that to Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, because he married and had children by this Egyptian woman, the daughter of Pharaoh. And Ephraim and Manasseh, I think we talked about it last week when we talked about Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, Deborah, Gideon, Jacob, all come from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So they were all part Egyptian. They would look, yeah, wow. All right, that aside. So Joseph's doing his thing. He's got his kids. He's got his wife. He's like royalty. There's all kinds of abundance. There's all kinds of food. They're storing it up. A famine hits, just like he said, and they start selling it and rationing it out. And he looks in the line of people, and there are his brothers. And there, like 20 years has gone by, but he can still recognize all of them because they pretty much look the same. Their beards are longer and grayer, and they've still got their same mannerisms. He has had that life stamped out of him, and he is full-on Egyptian. And so this whole big complicated play comes and the whole time he talks to them, he speaks through a translator and he acts like he doesn't know their language and he can understand everything they're saying. And he does this whole complicated thing, asks them if they have a little brother that didn't come with them, asks them how their dad is. They say, our dad's fine. Little brother's fine. And he's feeling out. Have, did they kill did they kill Benjamin too? Like did they hate me so bad because I was the daughter, son of Rachel that they killed Benjamin too? And he gets like a little feel that oh maybe they don't hate Benjamin so bad. Okay. So then he tells them to come back again, but not to ever come back unless they bring Benjamin, unless they bring their little brother. And you know, just to make sure everything's good, I'm going to keep that guy and he takes Simeon and throws Simeon in prison. We don't know why. There's nothing that Simeon did to show that he that Joseph was still mad at him or anything like that. And then uh, and then they go and they take their grain and all their money that they're supposed to pay for the grain still in the bag. And that's all confusing. They tell Jacob all about it. He's all confused. He's upset. Now I've lost Joseph. Now I've lost Simeon. And time passes. I'm skipping a whole bunch of stuff. They decide to go back. They say, look, we can't go back without Benjamin. They negotiate all. They go back with Benjamin. My favorite thing happens. Joseph sees them all, sees Benjamin. <laughs> he goes off. He cries. He comes back. They have this dialogue all through the translator. They have this big meal. He orders everybody out, even the translator. And you got to think, the brothers are all sitting around the table like, you know, now what do we do? He's going to kill us. They do. They talk and they say, he's going to kill us. And Joseph is sitting there, dressed full Egyptian, been speaking blah, 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 English or Egyptian language. And all of a sudden he says to them, I am Joseph. In their own language. And you know how when you see somebody at the mall or you see somebody at the grocery store and you're like, I kind of recognize them. Where do I know you from? And as soon as they say where you know them from, all of a sudden they look familiar. And you can see them in that exact spot. Here's all shaved, regal, kingly Joseph. And when he says, I am Joseph, it all fits. And they all see it. And it says they tremble with fear. And they're terrified. Well, Joseph says, what you intended for harm... God intended for good. His, his trust in God is so strong that even when evil, when evil, wicked people do even evil, wicked things to him, he doesn't even let them have credit for it. 
he still gives glory to God. God is doing great things. Oh, you did that? Oh. Praise God. God has saved so many people. God has done such good things. So look at how these brothers handled their hate and how Joseph handles his faith. And you can almost hear him saying, forgive them, God, they don't know what they're doing. They didn't know that they were saving many, many people because they weren't. God was. And so God brings about the salvation of all of them. They go get Jacob. They bring him down to Egypt. He lives in a section called Goshen. They all eat and it's great and it's awesome. And they all live happily ever after. They really do live happily ever after, every single one of them. Uh, even after Jacob dies, all the brothers are like, oh, shoot. Now dad's dead. Joseph's going to have his chance. And Joseph says, don't be afraid, you guys. I'm not going to hurt you. I've forgiven you. What you did for bad, God is tended for good. Look at all these people that got saved. Don't worry about it. And he forgives them. So, Joseph. Joseph finally dies. All right, here's a little add-on. You can quit listening now if you want, because this next part's going to be crazy, but I promise to keep it short. So, Joseph dies. They mummify him. They give him a burial like uh, any great Egyptian leader. And he says, hey, after I die, take my bones back home to the promised land. There's all these questions. How did they know 430 years later when the exodus happened? How did Moses know where Joseph's bones were? We don't really know. Scripture doesn't say. Um, but they had a box and the box had Joseph's bones in it. And... The rabbis talk about going through the desert while they're wandering in the desert. There's a point where they had two boxes and one was the Ark of the Covenant that they would carry. And the other was the box of Joseph's bones that they carried. And they really did. Um, but I won't tell you all the crazy stories that the rabbis come up with of what they did. Well, I'll tell you one. They put all of his bones in a lead box. This is what the rabbis, ancient rabbis say they did. Uh, the Egyptians saw the Nile as a source of great power, and they knew that Joseph was very powerful. So they put all of his bones in a lead box that was super heavy, and they sank it to the bottom of the Nile to keep the Nile powerful. And that's how Moses knew where to find it. So when they were fleeing Egypt, Moses could go over and pull that lead box out of the Nile and leave with it. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, you see this guy. Joseph, totally shining a light on Jesus. Jesus, hated by his brothers, right? Crucified by, betrayed by his own brothers, risen to power and glory, high above every name, and shows mercy to his brothers and rescues them and provides salvation for all of them. It's awesome. All right. God bless you.